Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. If we can get Michelle to sit down, we'll get started. <laughs> praise the Lord. We're glad to see you here tonight. Who has a praise report? Peter. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen, I tell you. We're going to agree with him. Brother Paul. Well, good. <laughs> That's what you want to hear. Praise God. The just shall live by faith. Who else? Well, good. Well, good. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? Well, stand with me. Yeah. Yet. <laughs> yeah, it's not raining. <laughs> Anybody feeling uh, bad tonight, sick or anything, hold your hand up and somebody's going to come pray for you. Anybody? Everybody's well? Then you better be happy tonight. Amen. Well, let's just worship the Lord together. Lord, we bless you. We honor you and we exalt your name. You're wonderful, God, and we exalt you above every name. Thank you for these praise reports we hear. Lord, you said a good report maketh fat the bones. 
And we thank you for that. We thank you for the faith that it loosens in our spirit and our hearts. We thank you that we can live by faith because we can trust you. So we bless you tonight. We pray that you touch our hearts in this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, Abba Father. You are worthy of all praise. To you our lives we raise. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You're awesome, Lord. You are awesome. As I come into your presence, I pass the gates of praise into your sanctuary until we're standing face to face. I look upon your countenance, I see the fullness of your grace. I can only bow down and say. Jesus, we feel you in this place. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And I feel Jesus. I feel Jesus. I feel Jesus in this place.
There's no name like the name of Jesus. If you're struggling with something tonight, just begin to address, address it with that name, Jesus. Jesus. A year or two ago, a lady called in and she, Claudia said, I don't know what to do with her here. Would you talk to her? She was uh, saying she was demon possessed and that Nothing would give her relief. Nothing. She said, I've pled the blood of Jesus. And nothing happens. It just mocks me. I said, well, here's what you do. He said, I plead the blood of Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God. So I had her start saying it. She said, "Woo, I feel something. <laughs> There's something about that name. There's something about it'll take you through the storm. He'll take you through the uncertainties of life. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, but I'll go with you to the end of the age. We're not at the end of the age yet, so he's still with us. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Give somebody a high five and say, I like Jesus. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Well, uh, Nancy, do you have any announcements? Okay. While uh, they're doing that, uh, don't forget Sunday morning. I want you to be there. We're going to have our annual business meeting, which we didn't have last year. So we're going to make up for it by having a great one. And we're going to do it on Sunday morning. So that ought to be a unique experience. <laughs> Let's, it'll, be, it'll be the service. Yeah, we're going to have praise and worship and prayer time, and then we'll conduct the business. And I'm going to share some things that I see that uh, may be some vision casting. So be here. Be ready. We, and if you're not a member, you're welcome. We want you to be here. That's why I'm doing it on Sunday morning. I want the whole church to hear what's happening and what God's doing at the university church. Well, we're in for a treat tonight. You know, most of the time, it's, it's old coots that are doing the talking. <laughs> well, it's kind of the truth. <clears throat> and we've got one young person. No, we've got another couple back here. Yeah. But uh, Ian Tate uh, has been, been hanging around here for, what, about three years? Roughly. Roughly. He's a blessing to the body of Christ. He's faithful. He has an anointing on his life, and this will be the first time he's spoken to an audience like this. So I want you to give a great big universal welcome to Ian Tate. Ian, bless you, buddy. Fun. <laughs> it, it's an honor to be in front of everyone who I hold in, t in such high esteem and who has been such a influence on my life. Um, over the past month since Skip asked me if I could preach tonight, I've been going back and forth on what I should preach about, and this is the one that stuck out to me the most. What to do about pride. There's good pride, and there's bad pride. You can have pride in the job that you do, the work that you do, but there's also the pride of elevating yourself above what God wishes. Um, so my beginning scriptures, there's a lot. <laughs> I, like, I like to use as many as possible because I believe God's word is truth and what are we without his word? So my first two are Mark 8.36. Uh, I forgot to highlight it myself. <laughs> it is, 
what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? And then the biggest one for tonight is Proverbs 16, verses 12 through 18. Kings detest wrongdoing, for a throne is established through righteousness. Kings take pleasure in honest lips. They value the one who speaks what is right. A king's wrath is a messenger of death, but the wise will appease it. When a king's face brightens, it means life. His favor is like a rain cloud in spring. How much better to get wisdom than gold, to get insight than rather than silver the highway of the upright avoids evil those who guard their ways preserve their lives pride goes before destruction a haughty spirit before a fall lord as i speak tonight i come to you in a nervous body and in an anointing that you have placed in my life god i ask that you give me the words to speak tonight and let them be your words in jesus name As I was worshiping earlier, I thought about something I didn't write down. The pride I want to talk about tonight places our faith in something other than God. Pride is what causes us to lose focus on what God wants us to do and what he wants to do in us. There are countless examples in the Bible of the results of this version of pride. Ananias and Sapphira, the religious leaders of Jesus' day, King Nebuchadnezzar, King Herod of Acts 12, and the kings of Judah and Israel and all of the wrongdoings, it all boils down to pride. Pride says, look at what I did. Look at me. I made myself great. I put myself where I'm at today. I can fool the best of people. This type of pride sometimes going even as far as to saying, I can fool even God. This applies to the church today, where we have pastors saying, I filled this service. Or worship leaders or people just in leadership saying, I did this thing to make this church. Instead of giving God the glory that he deserves. And there's also this pride not only covers that, but also covers us and saying, no one else knows. I can't let anybody else know what I'm going through. I have this image to uphold, this good, pure Christian image to uphold. I can't let anybody else know that I've struggled, that I've fallen this week, that I've messed up majorly, that I feel like I can't return from this. It prevents us from coming to the believers in Christ, our fellow Christians, and saying, I need help. Or even going to God and saying, I need help because we as a society, especially in America, have gotten this idea that we have to do it ourselves and we can't do it by ourselves. And I'm diagnosed myself with this pride. Uh, it's not been a fun experience. This past couple of weeks I've been dealing with some stuff that have been a result of this pride and I'm realizing how much it has ruined my spiritual walk so i'm not just coming from a place of you know just teaching but i'm coming from a place of experience <laughs> i got so excited in the progress that i was doing at my job the progress that i was having in my relationship with my fiance the things that were happening to make our wedding possible that God was allowing to make possible, but I got just so excited and so focused on this earthly things that I neglected to turn my eyes and give the glory to God, to say, I didn't control any of this. None of it's me, because I'm just a lowly human being, but through him, I'm everything. He makes me who I am. And because of that, I am reaping the results. Um, we, with this pride, we say, especially about certain situations, we go, thanks God, I got it from here. We literally go, I gave it to you, 
but I want it back now. And we say, I got it. And God's like, okay, I'll wait. I'll be here whenever you totally surrender. <laughs> you know, and then for however long down the line, maybe to the end of our lives for some people, but sooner rather than later, hopefully for the majority of us, we realize how big of a mistake that is and how much of a problem it creates not only for us in the natural but in the spirit because this pride chokes what God wants to do. And not only that, we lose sight of where eternity is. We lose sight on where our neighbor is going to spend eternity. And that means anybody, your passerby on the street, the person standing on the corner begging for money, begging for food. It, it encompasses all of that. We lose sight of it. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> um, we lose our shine. I'm talking the spiritual shine that we get from being in God's word every day, being faithful to pray. Yes, in these moments where we let this pride take over, we may be praying every day. We may be giving God glory and praise, but we are stifling what he can do. We lose the shine that was growing. We stop the shine from growing. And... So how am I, as a human being, supposed to fix it? How am I, as a believer in Christ, supposed to fix it? That brings me to my next set of scriptures, which are mainly, if, well, no, they're all in the New Testament, because uh, that's where I've been recently. And my first one is Galatians 5, 13. 13 through 26. And it's uh, the author of Galatians is talking about life in the spirit and he's talking about how the entire law is fulfilled in one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. And he continues to go on and go on about what living in the flesh does to us and the desires of flesh in verse 19 the acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's a warning to us, because our pride can lead to that, because our pride is our flesh wanting to take over again, wanting to wanting to take over what God is doing because we live in this constant battle between our, what our flesh wants and what God wants. But in verse 22, he says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, uh, gentleness, and self-control. I think I said those out of order, but we're good. <laughs> close enough, okay. Yeah, close enough. My brain was going through the motions in the song um god i love that song <laughs> um and so he gives us what the fruit of the spirit is and what we're supposed to live by we're supposed to live by love joy peace patience kindness goodness and self-control those are the things that we're supposed to strive for every day and in matthew 20 uh, matthew 6 19 through 13 the Lord shows us himself how to pray. And in the prayer, he goes on verse 12, And forgive us our debts, as also we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. That alone can help pride. Because all it takes is for us to take the bait of sin and the devil, or not even the devil, our flesh saying, but, but I can do it. Trust me, I got it. I can do it. I promise. I can get it this time by, with, by myself. And we, if we take it and we listen to it, we're sometimes worse than we were before. 
And the Lord's Prayer is not one just showing us how to pray, but what to pray about. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven doesn't just mean in the physical, it also means in myself. In my spirit, in my walk, let your will be done. Still a little bit nervous. <laughs> in uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest in me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecution, in difficulties, for when I am weak, he is strong. This pride says, I can't be humble. I can't. It is not possible for me to be humble. And that is the most <clears throat> important time for us to be humble. And it is those moments in greatest adversary where we have to give God praise. Because it's in those moments of so much pressure where we think we're going to burst, where we think we're going to combust from everything that's going on, the frustrations, and wanting to take it out of God's hands, that's where we find ourselves in pride. Where we say, I can do it, I got it, and then we immediately fall flat on our face. And I'm like, why did I do this? <clears throat> and so it's stated in the word, we can do it by praying seeking out God's word, studying it and applying it to our lives, not just reading it every day, not just reading a devotion, but finding a way to implement it into my life every single day. What can I apply about the scriptures I have learned today? What can I use right this instant and for the rest of my life? The word is living. It, you can read the same scripture and get something totally different each time. God designed it that way so that we can apply a new aspect of what God has shown us. God is so much more than we can imagine. This world is just a glimpse. This word is just a glimpse. We are told that we're going to be spending eternity learning and loving God. I can't understand that if this is it. If this is everything, then it makes no sense. So my pride has to decrease so that he alone can be justified and shown through me. And all I can think about is all these pastors that are fighting these battles of not being able to hold church and how at one point, our pride as a church, as the Church of America, got to the point where we wanted to be so loud, so audacious that that would draw in the crowd. That God's like, okay, let's knock it down a few pegs. Let's, let's take away your pride and see how you fare. And some of these pastors have fallen short and have succumbed to it. And then you have these pastors, these great mighty men of God, who are raising up to the challenge and saying, you are wrong. I have given to Caesar what is Caesar's. Now it's time to give God what is God's. And I, I think I'm just going to ignore the rest of my notes for a quick second. <laughs> because we think of pride as this big bad thing. When in reality, it can go one of two ways. It can go of, I'm giving all of my praise to God and taking pride in what God can do in me, but not allowing myself to get this big head to where I'm thinking I'm greater than what the situation is. When in reality, yes, God does not put us in a situation we can't handle, but he is also there with the strength we need to overcome it. 
so we can't look at ourselves and say, I have enough strength to do this on my own. Because we don't. <laughs> Speaking from personal experience over the past few weeks, we don't. <laughs> um, just coming up here and talking to you guys about this is sacrificing my pride in saying, oh, but they know everything. <laughs> they're, they're wiser and older than me. You know, they know everything. What more can I tell them that they don't already know? But sometimes it's little old me or the lady on the street that provides us with a new look at life or look at what God can do that changes everything. And that changes our outlook on what God can do. We limit ourselves on what we think God can do and what we think God is. We constantly put him in this box because we're constantly trying to take pride in ourselves to a matter of, I did it. You know, big, strong man, I did it myself. Like, becoming a version of Popeye where we think swallowing a couple of scriptures is just going to give us this otherworldly strength and we're going to be fine for the rest of our lives. (laughs) <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I wish it would work like that, but it doesn't. Um, but the thing is, is that we constantly need to say, God, I'm sorry for what I've messed up. And even if it means going to a brother and sister in Christ and admitting our faults, admitting our shortcomings, we have to be willing to do that in order to grow because they may have went through it before. They may have walked our walk, not the same way we did, but they have been through it and they know how God can work through it and how God can work with you through it to overcome the situation that you're in. God's shown me just in the past couple of weeks what it truly means to be broken, what it means to be not just broken phys- like physically, but spiritually and emotionally. Um, I put on a nice smile at church. I put on a good face. I like to think sometimes. <laughs> but inside, I'm crying. I'm in tears because of some of the situations that I'm going through right now. Uh, one of my pastors back in my parents' church said that He's fighting like battle one through nine, and he hasn't even come through battle one yet. Like he was working on one, and he was working through it. And then battles two through eight, through nine showed up. And he's, he's wanted to quit. He's wanted to say, I can't do it, and just give up. But that's where being humble and asking for help comes from. And that's how to combat pride. We constantly have to say, I can't do it on my own. I need help. I need the Holy Spirit to be with me every waking second of the day. Because the Lord knows I need it in traffic sometimes. I need it just in the grocery store, you know, dealing with my roommates. Just everyday things, I need it because my flesh is weak. But in that weakness, I can either choose to let sin prevail or let God's glory be shown and let his amazing mercy and grace flow through me in that moment. I cannot tell you how many times I have let my pride, just thinking I'm not the person, stop me from doing what God has told me to do. That, oh, I'm not, that's not me, you know, somebody else, it's somebody else. I've been in situations where God doesn't allow me to stay in that mode for very long, but I've also been in moments where God says, okay, I'll use somebody else. And I have realized in the last couple weeks that I don't want it to be somebody else. Granted, it shouldn't matter who it is. It shouldn't matter who brings the soul to Christ. But as long as I'm watering a seed or planting a seed, I want to do it so that I know that I've done something to influence, influence their eternity. <clears throat> the nervousness that 
a lot of people feel whenever it comes to it is just pride in thinking, I'm not enough. Because then that in itself is its own version of pride. Uh, we also have to be confident in what God has put in us, in what God has enabled us to do in order to do the Great Commission to go out into the world and preach the good news. To be able to lay hands on the sick and see them healed. To see them healed instantly, just like they were back in the New Testament, how they would just walk by and their shadow would heal them. There's nothing saying it can't happen today but our pride and our saying it has to be done this certain way. Worship has to be done this certain way Otherwise, we can't have service. The preaching has to be in a set format, three points, and then we're done. <laughs> that's how service has to go. And God's like, but that's not how I designed it. I designed you to come to me and enjoy my presence, to come and seek more of me, to wade deeper into the waters than you think you can handle. Because it's in those waters where we think we're going to drown that we find release, where we find joy, where we find happiness, where we find the fruits of the spirits that we've been asking for. We find those things the deeper that we walk into the river, the deeper we walk into his ocean of his grace and his mercy and just his presence. Just these past couple of days, as I've only been listening to Christian music, granted, I probably should have been doing it for a while, <laughs> but listening to it over just the past couple of days, I found myself internally singing praises, singing glory to God like I haven't done before. And in those moments, I'm like, yeah, he, he is glory. He is amazingness. He is more than I can ever express. And I want to get to know him more. I want to be able to show somebody and explain to somebody an aspect of who he is to me. Maybe not everything because we're not all the same people. We don't understand the same things. So what is it to me whenever I don't understand God the way you do, but I also understand that he's working in you? A lot of our pride in our denominations is we think it has to be done our way. It has to be done this certain way, this certain belief. That's it. No middle ground. There's no, not a compromise, but there's no understanding of God still uses who he chooses to use. He used a simple shepherd boy to take down a giant because the shepherd boy says, okay, okay. I will do what God tells me to do. And because you mocked God, giant, you're going to fall today. That's pride in our God is what we need. Pride in recognizing he is so much bigger than any situation that we hold dear. Any situation that we are holding so close to our chest. Because if we feel like we let it go, we won't know who we are. That we won't understand how to live life without it. When in reality, if we let go, that's where life begins. Life everlasting begins at letting go. So pride has to fall. The pride that wants to set ourselves above God has to fall. So that whenever God asks us to do something, we're good with it. We're okay. Sure. You know, I've always... This, I always say this weird compared to everybody else. I want to be known as the crazy person. I want my church to be known as the crazy church. Because it's sometimes in the craziness that the world sees is where God operates. Because our carnal minds can't understand it. We can't comprehend the magnitude of the way he works. So what if I look crazy to the outside world? It's already crazy enough. You know, you can just look at it and see what's happening. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to say that the world is just in utter chaos. 
God is coming soon, so in order to prepare for that, in order to prepare myself and my neighbor for eternity, I have to say, God, I'm going to crucify my flesh every single day to grow more in you, to grow more in Christ so I can show it to the world, to be a beacon of light that this world has never seen before. And if it looks crazy or insane, that's fine. Because I'm willing to look like a lunatic as long as it is for your glory and as long as you have told me to do it. That's how to deal with pride. Thank you, guys. <laughs> talk the rest of the night about pride the bible said that god gives grace to the humble but he resisteth the proud so thank you Ian. good word tonight we receive it gladly and we go home and examine ourselves kill pride kill pride kill pride kill pride well we're not gonna let you speak again because you're 15 minutes or Amen. <laughs> the devil always overplays his hand. Always. Praise the Lord. Well, uh, next time we'll give you 15 minutes credit. <laughs> Stand with me. You did good, Ian. The very first sermon I preached, I did it in about three minutes because that's all I knew is about three minutes worth. <laughs> I'd love to see you at prayer meeting Saturday night. It's from 6 to 7. Um, some of you used to come, and I haven't seen you in a long time. So I wonder if you're backslidden. <laughs> no, we, we, there's something about the strength of praying together that um, touches us. Be in prayer for Sunday, that everything goes well. Uh, some people have memories of uh, annual business meetings here. And those are the days that are, that are bygone, and uh, we're going to see great unity and great uh, joy. Amen? May God bless you with a spirit of humility and a spirit to be taught. And may God make your crooked path straight. May God hold up your hands when they're weary, strengthen your knees when they're feeble. May God go before you and behind you and around you. I bless you spiritually, physically, emotionally, financially, and relationally in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be blessed. <laughs>